Dr. Max Sinatter, our guest, he is the director of Brain Research Center at UBC, and he's an expert in the human brain. Mm -hmm. So much to learn, so much to learn. Now, a thorny question, I know, the male brain, the female brain. brain. Is the male brain really more linear? Well, I don't know if it's more linear, but it's, it's different. There certainly are things that boys do that, you know, and like to do that girls don't. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, they're much more prone to violence, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, they're much more likely to be in jail. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they often will do better at mechanical things. The question really is, how much of this uh, are you, you know, is a result of, how, of, of your genetics? You're just a male, you know? And how much of it is a result of the toys you were given to play with uh, as a child? Mm -hmm. And there's evidence that there actually, that there are these genetic propensities toward violence and toward, you know, uh, playing with, uh, you know, Lego as opposed to doing other things. But we can overcome that. You know, so we have great, uh, you know, engineering students uh, who are women. And uh, uh, we've got, uh, there's a lot of evidence that you can change patterns of behavior by what you're exposed to and what you do, especially when you're young. And you and I are, of course, still pretty yes, young. Yes, of course, but we're not in our cribs anymore. We're not in our cribs so anymore. So say we were. It's uh, best. Color stimulation, uh, music, noise. You know, the data say that basically you want to keep your brain active and engaged. And what you use uh, depends on where the infant or child is at that time. And if the kid likes music, I say give him a lot of music. Okay, even in the womb. But they yeah, say that absolutely. so many of our children are overstimulated today, or understimulated yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the impact of the computer on the brain, uh, yeah. social media on the brain. You know, it's, Do you see big changes? I don't know. I, I don't actually think that's so serious. I think mm. that, you know, we're built to raise good children. We've had, you know, 50,000 years as a species to learn how to raise kids under a whole variety of different circumstances. You know, it could be said, oh yeah, now that those saber-toothed tigers are around, things really are different. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's always different. And we've learned to adapt, and our young brains have learned to adapt. We seek out stimuli that are appropriate for ourselves. There's evidence that young children will go and find things that are good for them. Mm -hmm. But those of us who grew up around radio, yeah. we had to make pictures in our heads. We yeah. did because we, we did. couldn't see them. Yeah. And then my children grew up with the big bird and people like yeah. that. So they, they yeah. became so visual. Yeah. Does that affect the human brain really or do we well, just adapt? Well, everything that comes in changes your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, if the audience remembers this conversation, it's going to be because what they heard, what they saw, affected their brain, changed the connections in their brain. That's how memory works. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Mm -hmm. And if you associate two things together, it's because those two brain cells that were connected at that moment of the association become stronger in their connection. Right. Okay, so um, we had a drinking game when I was in university. Uh, and you'd go around and uh, have to do this poem. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four corpulent porpoises, five limerick oysters, six pairs of Don Alverzo's tweezers. And I still remember that. I can Fabulous. go to ten. Fabulous. And, and if you missed out, mm -hmm. you know, if you couldn't get to one hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, yeah. then you had to have another sip of <laughs> no, beer. No, yeah, that would so improve you, your performance, That I'm would sure. not improve your performance, <laughs> possibly. But there were... Uh, uh, students in the circle who couldn't get to one hen, two ducks, three squawking geese. They never got to uh, the oyster part yeah. uh, mm -hmm. of the round. You know, there's a tremendous range of memory capacity. And I think what we, I think in the next like 10 years, you're, you know, maybe the next 20 years, you're mm -hmm. going to be able to dial up how strong you want your memory to be. Really? I, I think we're going to get to that. I really do. Now, you don't want your memory to be, to be perfect, I tell you, because, you know, those people who have the perfect autobiographical memory, they say it's a torment. Mm. All these unwanted mm -hmm. thoughts keep coming back to them, the girlfriends that dumped them, uh, you know. <laughs> right. And it's... It, oh, it, her. <laughs> it, it, it also tends to promote... Uh, an inability to see the big picture if your memory is too good. So there's a famous book mm. called The Mind of a Memnist. It was written about 50 years mm. ago. It's by A.R. Luria. I read it 40 years ago. I still remember it. Right. Um, and it tells the story of this sort of mid-level Russian official who had an absolutely perfect memory. You could read him a list of 100 numbers, 
and he could recite them back to you, and he could do that 30 years later. But he was a mid-level bureaucrat. He was not imaginative. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even all that smart. You have to be able to forget in order to separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, so clean the closet out. You have to clean the closet. Yeah, you have to, you know, have that rummage sale. Okay, because some days we do have blunder brain, you know. <laughs> we do, we do. Well, nice to see you again. Come on my new show. Pleasure to see okay. you, Fanny. Wonderful to be here. Uh, uh, Dr. Max Sinatter, uh, Director of the Brain Research Center at UBC.